Good evening. On behalf of the Indiana University College of Arts and Sciences, I would like to thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Vanessa Clo, and I serve as the college's director of alumni relations. Our Food for Thought live streaming series serves as an opportunity for alumni and friends to hear from faculty experts, explore topics of interest, and stay connected with IU and the College of Arts and Sciences, regardless of your location. I'm excited to introduce tonight's featured presenter, Professor Linda Pisano. Professor Pisano is an award-winning costume designer for theater, opera, and ballet with over 100 professional design credits. She serves as a chairperson for the Department of Theater, Drama, and Contemporary Dance here at Indiana University and is a member of the United Scenic Artists Local 829. Her work is featured on stages and in exhibitions throughout the United States and internationally in Russia, China, the United Kingdom, Canada, Taiwan, and Prague. Following her presentation, Professor Pisano will be joined by visiting assistant professor of costume design and college alumnus, Jason Orlinko for the audience Q&A session. Professor Earl Orlinko is an experienced costume designer whose design work has been seen across the Midwest. You can submit your questions at any point during this evening's discussion. Simply click on the Q&A tab located in your webinar toolbar. Hover your mouse over your screen and your toolbar should appear. Now it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Pisano for her presentation. Thank you. Hi there. <laughs> Welcome. I'm really grateful to be able to speak with you tonight. Uh, and what's wonderful is that I get to share my passion and my love. I have been in the theater for a very long time, uh, starting before I turned the age of 11 with my first professional gig. And the importance of this is to sort of share with you what I try and share with my students, and that is that I feel very fortunate and grateful continually that I do what I love to do. I have been able to uh, navigate not just a career, not just day to day, but I'm able to live it, to experience it, and to pass it on to the students. So what I'd like to do today uh, is share my screen and I'm going to share with you uh, images to best uh, go through and kind of describe what I do. So let me start off with a short 25 second little video here, just for fun. And this is me, not in the drawing, this is just me drawing. What I love about that video is that it's sped up. Obviously, I don't draw that fast, but that is what I spend so much of my life doing. And I am truly so grateful for that. So I just wanna share really quickly a little bit of my story because I think it's important to understand where this comes from. I uh, do not have a job per se, what I do have is a, a passionate uh, way of life, a way of life that, as I said before, is very rewarding and, and something I'm grateful to pass on. But what I'd like to share is if you look over to the far left, you see uh, a wonderful image of my parents when they were very young. I still have her suit. So I come from a, a family, uh, a mother who was particularly stylish. Uh, and you can see I come from the, I'm the youngest of six and I am this little sad person in the bottom center. I was so sad that I didn't get to dress up in a costume that year. And I'm pretty convinced that that's why I have turned this into my career. I don't know, just saying. But what I'd like to go to is just to tell you that design is always with me. It isn't just a job. It is a life immersed in the principles and elements of design. I love to have my environment, uh, something that is continually inspiring me. And it's important that I encourage my students uh, to do that as well. 
So the ABCs of costume design, armor, bloomers, and corsets, oh my. And I can even dye your eyes to match your gown, jolly old town. Now I'm really grateful that I was able to put this down because this image below is of Dr. Faustus at the Utah Shakespeare Festival. And at this time, uh, contact lenses, non-prescription contact lenses had just become a thing. And there's some very uh, close seating to the stage. So we were able to get all the uh, seven deadly sins and the various demons and Mephistopheles himself with these very bizarre contact lenses. And by getting that on stage, it was very unexpected. And in doing that, it was something exciting and new for the, for the audience to experience and the actors too. So one of the things that I like to tell young people, I often am asked to speak with groups of, of young people, not just adults, but children. And I like to say, I draw pictures and they come to life. And in the most simplest fundamental terms, that's true. I drew this picture of the ghost of Christmas past. And if you go to the Indiana Repertory Theater starting next weekend, you can see that the ghost of Christmas past has come to life. Now, it isn't simple though. It is a complex and relatively long process, um, but one that is uh, exciting and involves, one of the reasons it's exciting is it involves so many people. So I can draw a picture, but, it does require that, yes, I've done a tremendous amount of research. I've analyzed and studied the script. I've done a lot of character analyses on all the various characters in a script. I've then met with the artistic team, which includes the director, a choreographer, the composer, the other designers. But then a whole nother part of this is working with collaborators who are tailors, craftspeople, and uh, dressmakers and managers. And then ultimately we bring the performer in. And that's another part of the collaboration, working with the actors or the singers or the dancers, whomever it might be. And then finally, we bring the audience in. And that's when we become uh, fully immersed in that experience. So many things, sometimes we're called upon, this is a little fuzzy on your right, sometimes we're called upon to do things like Mephistopheles there. Other times we're called upon to do uh, something from another time period. Um, and so what is the fundamental part of what we do? It's research. It's absolutely uh, really important to not only come into any process, having been very well read. Um, I love reading. It's a very important part of my daily life. Every time I can get into a museum or an exhibition or a collection, I will. I have a, a, an amazing photo archive of things that I've been, I've been um, fortunate enough and privileged enough to visit. Uh, this is not just in museums, but actually in the uh, artifacts that I've been able to handle in the archives. And of course, those of you who are alum and work at IU know that we have tremendous resources right here on our own campus for these things. Uh, ultimately, however, uh, the research becomes very important. So for example, I was actually shopping fabric for the opera Parsifal, which was being produced at the Jacobs School of Music a few years ago. And uh, I was shopping three shows, but this, this particular uh, a few days was, was simply for that production. Um, and that was a, a large, to say the least. But one of the things that was happening is I was, I was struggling with one particular item that I'd sketched. It wasn't really what I wanted, but I happened to go to the Met and I was looking through muse uh, the museum collection and I came across this. And it completely inspired me. And what I'm looking at focusing on is actually the, the belted area of the torso. So that was something that I stumbled upon and it spoke to me, not just the shape and the way the, the apparatus works, but also the, the color and the texture and the, and the detailing on it. Research is really critical and it can come from textiles, as you can see on your left, it can come from ancient 
uh, images of other cultures that are other than than myself. Um, and we also need to look at how we are designing in terms of looking at designing work from another culture, even if it was composed or written, in this case, Madam Butterfly, composed by a Western composer. So here is an example of an opera. So what I do when I create my uh, designs, uh, I like to present them in such a way that the director and the other designers and ultimately the makers, the, you know, the tailors and the craftspeople, and really ultimately the performers um, are able to uh, look at my, my process visually. So Chojo San, uh, this particular rendering uh, is, we, this is a sketch, but we refer to them as renderings. Um, this is a 20 inch tall rendering. So that's what a 16 inch figure. Uh, and then there's a number of pieces of research. And so you'll notice that that research includes um, factual research, uh, uh, primary research. Uh, for example, the middle image on your left side is a marriage. Uh, yet we also have right next to that a watercolor that's very evocative. And then we have an artifact, which is a kimono, which the color uh, was very influential in creating the palette. But one of the things that you don't see is all the, the written and uh, uh, research and the, the uh, reading that I had to do to ensure that I wasn't appropriating, that I was uh, creating something that was telling the story that retain the integrity of the music, that the ensemble could move in, that the, the uh, lead characters could move and, and function and sing to their best capacity in. But I also had to nod to, of course, the culture of which I am not, uh, I am, because I am not Japanese, I had to understand and uh, get the information I needed to be able to produce something that was authentic. In, in that same vein, sometimes I'm doing Western, most of the time I'm often doing Western, Western costume, so, excuse me. And so in this case, uh, this is how I present it. You're seeing one of my bound books. So this is the book I'm working from right now. It's about uh, 200 pages long and it is my, and I've cre created the book and then had it printed. Um, and you can see all my notes up there, my tabs of all the characters and information. And what it includes, and you'll see a few of these examples as we go through, what it includes is not just research of the garments so that the makers and, and, and the director and actors can see historically what we're going for, but you can also see some of the textiles. So I'm reaching, re researching textiles so we can get a sense of authenticity and of the color palette. Now I wanna make a point here, when we're designing for performing arts, we're not trying to be um, period accurate all the time. If we're doing a documentary, of course, that's important. And oftentimes with a historical figure, we wanna get as accurate as possible. But at the same time, we need to tell the story. We're focusing on the humanity of the characters. And so we do, uh, we do sort of have to modify designs a bit, not just in their appearance, but in their wearability because a woman wearing particularly one of these dresses is going to move very differently than if we ask an actor to tumble across the stage in that same garment. So that's gonna happen. And sometimes you'll see even more extensive stylization. For example, let's take a look at a Showtime's The Tudors or um, some of our, our more recent Netflix miniseries, which we've been talking about in our historic costume class. And they often will set the story uh, loosely in a period, but then they'll choose colors or patterns. And that's telling the story that they want to tell. And so that is the design part of it. So it's not all just period research. The sketch of the rendering is the designer's communication tool. So here on your right, you see uh, um, with a little more clarity, uh, one of my sketches are for Chesha San, for the, um, 
uh, for Madam Butterfly. And uh, this, this will change. Uh, it, it does change a bit according to the fabric again and the color. And then of course, whomever is cast in the role, we design usually long before we've cast. On the other hand, you can see on the left, I often do contemporary work as well. And so here we have a married couple uh, and she is a nurse and uh, he is actually a ghost. Uh, the, the father has passed away and so he's a ghost that comes back, but he is how the children remember him. And so he is in contemporary wear. So you can see that that the type of research and the type of, of um, looks that we're asked to create are, are have a very wide latitude. Yet at the same time, they're all about the human experience. Except sometimes they're not human. <laughs> so here's an example of Florencia and Elena Amazonas, which was also at the Jacob School of Music. And uh, here's, uh, you, if you saw that, you remember that there were many animals from the Amazon that, that we had, that the, the director brought in and, and they were choreographed to run around the ship going down the Amazon, right? And, and they were puppeteers. And so the, everything was, was um, created that way. So let me walk you through uh, this, uh, that I added on this piece of research so you could see the, the, the bird and uh, the species in which this uh, puppet uh, was designed after. But you can see when I lay out my book, I have the title of the production. I have the Harpy Eagle times one. That means there's one of them. Some of these I had like four, six, 10. Then over on the side, you can see Harpy Eagle Puppeteer times one, and you see a list of items, and that's a piece list. They have a unitard, they have wings, gloves, boots, bats, ballet slippers, headdress, and then they have a specialized makeup. So that is for the wardrobe crew, the people running things backstage. Now, this is actually really simple. When you get into a period production, sometimes these piece lists are pages and pages long. I've had them hundreds of pages long for a big, large opera or musical. So these are the way in which we communicate with others. I'm gonna show you one more uh, example of sketching. We may not go through the whole thing. It's about three and a half minutes long, but I wanna go through this so that you can, uh, I can talk you through a little bit. This is me sketching um, with an ink pen and I'm sketching two um, uh, uh, sort of Elizabeth Bennett and Mr. Darcy. And I actually did another video. So those of you who are affiliated with the um, Arts and Humanities Council, I had shared a little bit of this uh, before, uh, about a year and a half ago. So what I wanna show here though, is I work um, with a pen mostly. This is not always the case, but I do try and get my students to work with a pen. And what I want to, to now I'm going <laughs> to condense three years of MFA training into, you know, uh, three minutes here. And that is what I try to do is to get the students to understand three things. The first is the, the, the history or the style in which they're trying to produce. So in this case, an empire uh, gown, just having the fundamentals of the time period or the culture down well enough. And so much of this, you know, comes through experience, but have it done well enough that it's um, easy for them to, to see uh, quickly and to sketch quickly. The, the other thing I want them to do is to be able to understand the character well enough that they can pose them in such a way and think of their psychology. So for example, if this little head sketch I'm doing here was Mr. Collins, we know that he's sort of a, a strange little creepy character according to Jane Austen. And so trying to get a sense of, of um, that as I sketch. But using the third is to be confident with their, their work so that they're not so caught up in drawing that they forget the design. A lot of people get very insecure about, uh, students in particular, insecure about drawing. And so they get so insecure about their drawing that they forget to design. And it is important for us to, to think about the fact that we really just need to get the information across. And so by using a pen, there's no erasing. So the, the students in many of their exercises and their warm-up exercises that I ask them to do 
are uh, working on going instinctive. They're focusing on their gut reaction to what they've read, or if it's a dance, having sat in and watched uh, dancers or having met with a choreographer and talked about the music and the meaning of the piece. If it's, if it's um, not necessarily, for example, a story ballet like the Nutcracker, which has characters and an arc of the story and so forth. But you don't always have that with, with especially uh, a wide range of dance. So um, it is important that yet you're thinking that the designer is working, able to sketch quickly. And one of the things about also using a pen is that you can sit down with the director and sketch as you go. So uh, uh, the best productions that I work on, the producer has everyone get together for a couple of days, usually you know, in some sort of um, a situation where there's a lot of food and sugar involved, but they're together talking, going through scene by scene. We have our laptops out for research. We have books with us for our research. We also have a lot of um, our sketchbooks with us. In my case, I have a pen and this way I'm not erasing. And if I can get myself doodling fast enough, um, then I'm actually going to be able to communicate relatively quickly my ideas. So the, the, the uh, director can then work with you and see how you're creating these things and it allows for uh, a more collaborative experience. So here you have your Mr. Darcy and his fine, his fine wear. Okay, let's move on. So another example of the book, again, I also, uh, so the reason I put this page out here from Christmas Carol is, and you can probably guess, there's two very different types of sketches here. So here's uh, a group of ensemble uh, characters in, in the play, uh, the doctor, old Joe, the poultry man, schoolmaster, the undertaker, and so forth. So you can see how I've used pen and created these sketches. I was very inspired by the original prints in the Dickens book. And so I tried to, to sort of render with that style um, and, and sketch them out with that sensibility, right? And then I used swatches to show the, the colors rather than painting all, all, all of them. Well, the reason there's this image on the side is that there was a character added and it's this old washerwoman sort of character or a pawnbroker who's instead of being the traditional male, it, it, because we do, we are, you know, designing in a way where the director is instructing us in terms of the gender, but something that it, it happens a lot in the theater, especially something like Christmas Carol that is going to be um, renewed over and over again, is that you, you don't necessarily have binary characters. But in this case, you can see this rough sketch that I did with the director and uh, to, to demonstrate what we wanted it to look like. That way I didn't have to go back and do a detailed sketch. Here's another example of what I'm working from. You can see how my notes are in there uh, and so forth. Um, another example, this is uh, La Toile, an opera. There were six of these maidens. And this is also a steampunk, it's a little dated, but uh, you can see all the little working drawings and so forth. Uh, Parsifal again, um, these are really big. These are like 24 inches tall. And that's probably why they're a little blurry. Uh, this is also about 24 inches tall. This is from a sketch I did for, of the first ladies for a recent grant at IU, the first ladies of the, the presidents, the early presidents of IU. And so again, looking, this was, we tried to be more authentic, but again, we didn't have full garments. We didn't have artifacts. We didn't necessarily even have real photographs that, that were anything below the neck up. And so I had to do a lot of research of the resources. So this was very factual in that I had to find out what fabrics, who did the laundry, how the dresses were made and so forth. Okay, so how do you go from the research and the sketches to the actual garment? Well, there's a whole lot of parts I'm going to skip here, but shopping is a big part of the job. And so I am not going to skip that part. I love shopping fabrics and we source that all over the world. And that's one of the most difficult things. Actually, on, on March 13th was a Friday of 2020. And I was scheduled to fly out that weekend to go shopping for uh, a, a fabric in New York. 
and New York shut down. No. So um, I have not been back, but I'm going back uh, relatively soon here. And I'm excited about that. But I have to go out with my sketches. I make little thumbnails of the sketches. I photocopy them very small. It used to be that I had to take them, but now, you know, we have what? computers anyway and so i'm able to to go out and shop fabrics i shop it takes days to shop sometimes uh, they're very organized and have the prices and the, the style and what they're made of this is from bnj fabric in new york uh and other times they're you know sometimes they are organized so you can see things like trims but other times they're just big giant piles of fabric and you have to dig through them and i'll be honest that is my favorite. This is all fabric I purchased. So I actually helped to pile this on. Um, and then they, of course, they ship it from New York or LA, depending on where I'm, I'm purchasing. Um, and so we, uh, sometimes when I go into a store such as B&J Fabric here, um, I have to, I take post-it notes and I write out exactly how much, and then I create a table uh, full of all the swatches and they know how much I need of each. So the swatching is really impor an important part because this is where I have to think about what the makers are going to do, what my human resources are, and what my financial resources are, and also the time. And so I try and create, for example, this is a feathered fabric. It's a trim that's feathered. And that red is a different fabric, by the way. It's two photos covering each other. But uh, that was already pre-placed uh, on a fabric. And by pay paying a little more for that, where it's already pre-stitched on, I saved in labor costs of someone having to do it. I do love details. I love to layer fabric. So you can see the sequins over fabric on your left and you can see the trim on a leather with, <laughs> with rhinestones and a skull. And this was for Parsifal's armor. Um, uh, I, my swatch books are pretty crazy per show. This is what they look like. This is what I carry around in my bag and, and when I'm shopping, here's another one. Um, show is that I have to remember anyway. Oh, and there's, um, there's, uh, that, that, uh, oh, what's the dog at mood? Uh, Jason will have to remind me during the Q and a anyway. Uh, and here's a fabric getting ready to get cut at a store. One of the lovely things about working at IU is I can take my grad students as my assistants. Uh, they're fantastic. And so what happens is they actually get to go out and well, we do have some fun at Times Square, of course. Um, we have a really terrible time, but we do. I do try and get them to collections, but I make sure that we go to a wide range of different types of fabric stores. So, and I stand back, as you can see, I'm sneaking a photo there, um, so that to empower them to work with the sales associates themselves and to really, even though I'm always there, uh, I allow them to sort of get the autonomy of designing their own work and, and cutting their own fabric and figuring out uh, what they need to. So it's a really great field trip. So once those swatches come back, uh, once those fabrics come back, they're swatched into my books and then they're turned into beautiful garments. And here's Dana Zvetkov from the Jacobs School of Music, head of costumes there. She's amazing. She can make anything. Although these... Um, these uh, these are for a production of Candide, uh, and you can see how these fabrics uh, go together. So what ends up happening is the reason I show this is that you can see how these are layered on top of each other. So all of that, uh, for example, on your right, that's all layers and layers of different fabrics on top of each other and then modeled and, and dyed. And so there isn't, this isn't like you go out and purchase it. You actually have to make the fabric by layering the yardage of fabrics and piecing them together. So there is a certain amount of couture involved in certain things. And here's a close up of again, um, some of the work done. Um, matching fabrics, you can, once you, if you have a great tailor, use it. Look at this fabric, that's incredible matching. Here's another incredible fabric. Um, this is for Christmas Carol, and this is for um, um, Salome at uh, Opera San Antonio. Uh, leather work, this is a mask in Parsifal, so just to show close up the kind of work. Uh, this is uh, just to show one of the things that we have to do are mock-ups, and that means um, you have to create something in a, a, a cheaper cotton and then turn it into the actual garment. But what you're seeing here is actually the corset 
and the petticoat and the inside of the sleeve poofs made by one of our graduate students. And that dress over there was made by one of our graduate students. And the rendering you can see down there is mine. And so that's the research. I found fabric. I, I was able to find the lace and so forth. And then I work with the draper cutters to tell them what we need. And then their um, tremendous expertise and skill creates all of these, all of that piping, all of that work is, is done by them. It's, it's truly remarkable, even the embroidery. And this, I didn't even ask for this. And I was like, what did you do? That's amazing, just amazing. Here they are on our loading dock, <laughs> the first ladies of, of IU. Again, just some just how you might have a finished rendering and then rough sketches, doodles. Sometimes we use green screens. So I work as some of the funniest stories. I was asked by a director at Utah Shakespeare Festival to make horns on a, a night. He had these horns grown in Dr. Faustus and he wanted them to start on fire and uh, disappear. And we did it. We made it work. Um, uh, uh, you have to look at the whole ensemble. So this is me in tech, uh, tech rehearsals, technical rehearsals, dress rehearsals, um, seeing how things are working. Um, here is a, a production of Mass. Uh, again, a technical rehearsal with orchestra. Uh, this is in the Ruth N. Halls. Uh, this is this last summer we uh, uh, streamed. Uh, our production. And I wanted to show you this because we, I, I'm doing usually anywhere between five, six shows a year. And so while Parsifal, you can see it streaming down there live, is on my laptop and I'm sitting in a theater watching a technical rehearsal of Christmas Carol. And I looked and I was like, oh, it's two men in flowing robes on an icy tundra. There we go. And uh, these are shows. So I was, I had just opened one the night before and I ran up and there I was in technical rehearsal for another. And so I just, I, I wasn't listening to the Parsifal but I had it streaming so I could watch it and see how it worked. Unfortunately, I didn't get to go to opening night of that. And it is a wonderful time. It's a great job. I love what I do. You, it's always uh, something unusual. You, you just never know what you're gonna have. And my job did exist during quarantine of the pandemic. It just looked a bit different. So that is in a nutshell, what I do. And uh, so I am open to questions and I am so grateful that my colleague, uh, Professor Jason Orlenko, also a costume designer and rhinestone extraordinaire, is here with us. Hello, Linda. Thanks for that presentation. So I have a first question for you before we start taking questions from the audience. Again, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, there is the Q&A uh, button down at the bottom of your Zoom screen and just type it in there and I will try to keep my eye on them. Mm -hmm. um, but my first question is, what does IU mean to you? What does IU mean to me? Yeah. I, I love that question. It means so many things and it's meant a lot over the years. Um, well, one of the things is, is that uh, I, am a, I, I live in Bloomington. I've been here for uh, a while now and I did have two teaching jobs previous, which I loved. They were an opportunity for me to lot, meet a lot of people and hone my teaching. But one of the things about IU is having a graduate, uh, a graduate program is that the resources here are remarkable. The resources are incredible. I mean, the performance opportunities, the, uh, the museums, the, uh, just the collections and the archives and the resources, the human uh, connections that you make of people that have most amazing things. Um, one of your peers in grad school, I remember took a, 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 a 18th century French literature class <laughs> at, because uh, she was designing dangerous liaisons. And so we were able to get her enrolled and she was able to really, again, immerse herself in that experience. Um, but I, the resources are phenomenal. And I love being in a place that understands the idea of, of the rigor of arts and humanities. So I guess that's it. That's what yeah. I would say. <laughs> great, thank you. And I love our building. It's a great <laughs> building. <laughs> we do have excellent facilities for theater at IU. Um, 
I do have a comment here. The dog at Mood in New York, his name is Swatch. That's right, Swatch. I kept, yeah, thank you. I have my own dog sitting here, but there's, yeah, Swatch. Thank you. <laughs> sure. So I have, a, I have a few questions here while we wait for some more to possibly come in. I know as a costume designer, one of my favorite parts of the whole process is um, you um, being in tech rehearsals or dress rehearsals and seeing the whole production come together. So seeing an actor come out on stage in their costume for the first time while they're being lit on the set. Um, and I'm just curious what, what sort of your favorite part of the whole process is. I know you talked a little bit about fabric shopping already. Oh, but... <laughs> yeah, that's always great fun, right? Um, it's hard work, but um, I really enjoy fittings. Uh, so when I'm in there with the actor and the, the dressmaker, and sometimes there's a craftsperson or whomever, because whether I'm in a situation where the actors and, and the dressmakers are students, and I'm in this conversation about, well, you know, working with them, or um, whether I'm working professionally and I have these very seasoned actors that come in and know exactly what they want to do um, and, and what they want, that is the, um, I, I just love that communication. And as you can tell, I'm a, as you know me, I'm a talker. And so I really love meeting new people. And so fittings is a great place to get to know people. Thank you. Yes. So there's two questions here that I think will actually relate to each other. So I will ask both of them. Okay. Um, the first one is, what does a draper do? And then Ooh. the second one here is, can you recycle costumes for different sized actors? Oh, those are great. Those are great questions. And we both have answers to those. Okay. So um, what does a draper do? So uh, a, a tailor is someone who is creating measurements and creating um, cutting two-dimensional forms or creating patterns. A draper is someone who is interpreting a design and draping it onto the dress form. So they're a dressmaker who's actually draping uh, a cheaper fabric, a uh, less expensive fabric. Uh, uh, it, it's either a, a muslin or it's um, a, a, a cotton or a twill and they are draping that. And then it's draped, uh, sort, usually I think it's draped, most of the time it's draped inside out. And then it's put onto the actor as a mock-up in the fitting um, and fit, custom fit to them. And that you're exactly right. That goes to the second question is, can we change? Yes, to some extent. Uh, most of the time, you know, a lot of people go, oh, well, a five eighths or, or a half inch seam allowance or whatever. Well, we have a variety of seam allowances in each theater company. Some companies know, for example, if you're doing a, a Christmas carol or a nutcracker, you might have several inches of seam allowance in there because it's not just the, the width and breadth, but it's also the height. And so, uh, for example, dancers, you might be doing a ballet where all the tutu bodices are the same measurement around, but then you have a 5'9 and a 5'2 dancer in different companies, right? Uh, because it's double or triple cast. So we do as much as we can. Um, yes. <laughs> And then another related question that just came up here is, do you reuse costumes in their original mode or do you take them apart and use them in other costumes? Both. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and it depends um, because if we're, you know, um, theater cost, we, we recognize the cost of, of um, costumes and, and the biggest cost is not just the extraordinary fabrics, but also the quality when you have something that's really well made. So a lot of companies will rent things. So for example, if we're doing a lot of uniforms as we did in Three Penny Opera, we had some um, um, Bobby costumes, the Bobby cops, right? Yes, the London yes. police officers. Police officers, yes, yes. Those, those were from Oregon Shakes, weren't they? They were, yes. Yeah. We actually so, reached out to a couple of different companies to find, oh, find did, to get, get enough in time. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. So those are rentals. So other than some modest modification to tailor them, to fit them to the actors, we can't really change much because we don't, you know, that was an investment made by the original company uh, or the original theater company or opera company. Um, 
but we do uh, of our own stock, we take things apart and dye them and piece them together all the time. We are upcyclers, recyclers, re reuse, reduce, reuse, recycle. <laughs> Yes. And to add on to that a little bit, if you don't mind, please, I, I was a design assistant at American Players Theater in uh, South, Southern Wisconsin for four summers, and they would take whole dresses apart and redo them entirely, but keep all the different parts. So there was actually a box of sleeves. It's like, well, I have this dress. Let me go look in the sleeve box and see if there's sleeves that match it. That <laughs> works for a different way. Yeah. You know, I, I remember. Yeah. See, it's so funny how that happens. I remember in grad school, um, the costume shop supervisor at that time had this 1970s corduroy suit, which was amazing tailored up here, but the pants were really 70s. And they cut apart the pants and they turned it into a Regency tail coat, like a frock coat by using the pants as the tails. It was, it was pretty great. Um, another question, of all the shows you've done, which design are you most proud of so far? Wow, that's really uh, difficult to say. Um, I, I guess I don't think about what is most, the, everything always seems unfinished to me. I always want to do it differently when I watch it. I'm like, oh man, I could have done that. I could have done that. It's not that I'm unhappy. It's just that, oh, if I, if I could do this again, you know, I, and so, um, I really gauge my, I, and I promise I'm not deflecting or trying to do a cop out answer here. <laughs> I really gauge it by the experience. So um, it, of who I'm working, who I'm working with and so forth. And, and one of the reasons I, I love working at the Jacob School of Music is because of Dana, where she's just an amazing collaborator to work with. But I will say that I had a, a lovely time a few years ago with, um, a Candide at the Des Moines Metro Opera. And also uh, I, I, there were some beautiful with uh, beautiful designs that were executed beautifully as well for San Antonio Opera, which you saw the coat from, which was a Salome. Um, that was pretty great. Um, but I will say that, that sometimes the subject matter of a production or the people I'm working with that make it the most one that I'm most proud of because it's so cohesive and so mm -hmm. beautiful. Yeah. Excellent. Um, and then we're going to pivot here a little bit to okay. uh, academics. So Ooh. what is your favorite textbook, or I'm going to add on to this question, textbooks for teaching costume design? Oh, okay. Well, Tom Huxane teaches the costume re rendering. Oh no, is it here? I'm looking back here. Sorry, this is really I don't think I have mine either. <laughs> Do you have yours there? Anyway, no. yeah. So it's it's like it's like the staple. And she's a she's amazing. So she studied uh, painting in Beijing for some time before uh, coming to the United States for her MFA, where she uh, studied costume design. And uh, so what she, she wrote a book about um, how to communicate effectively, because we are not illustrators, we're not painters or portrait artists, we're designers, but we have to communicate. And the difference between what we do in our, in our drawings and what a fashion designer does is that we, each one of our drawings has to express something about the character. It has to have the sense of the character in it. And she recognized that very quickly for many reasons. Um, and and she's, she's a tremendous teacher too. Uh, and so she wrote that book and has kept up. Um, and, and, and that is just a great book for teaching students how to look at the human body through time as well. And, and how different uh, cultures and different time periods value different human bodies and how clothing fits on that. Um, but I would also say, um, I, there are some textbooks, as a matter of fact, my colleague Heather and Milam and I co-wrote one with the group, um, but I, I would say, again, this is going to be a cop out, I'm so sorry, the best textbook is really uh, taking, going shopping in New York and getting, assisting and getting hands-on experience at a variety of places. Um, but there are some textbooks, if anyone wants to email me, I'm happy to send the bibliography upon which I base my curriculum. 
Yes, because we have another question of what was the name of the book? I, and it's character, costume. I always forget the order of the oh, character, no, costume, and figure drawing. And so we both have it at our offices at IU. <laughs> no, I can't believe it. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Please, please email me. I'll have 100 emails. What is that? Please email me. I really, really will, will be happy to send the bibliography along. Yeah. Um, great. So another question. Which is harder to design, historical or contemporary? Oh, contemporary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is. So, and we should, I mean, I, I know you feel the same way, don't you? I do, that? yes. Yeah. It's really hard because, you know, clothing, we wake up every morning. It's so personal. And everyone is their own expert in their own clothing. And so when you're trying to create something contemporary, then there's always it, it can it can really disengage from the storytelling if someone is saying well why did they wear this brand or why did they choose and then if you have to make something and purchase contemporary clothing and put it together sometimes it's a little difficult to see how it to make it merge well but contemporary is always very difficult mm -hmm. you know it's hard to be objective about our own time sometimes yes. Yeah. Um, character, costume, figure drawing, and I'm going to have you say our, the author's name. Ton Huxang. Huxang. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you to Ashley Bellet for putting that in Thank the chat. Thank you, Ashley. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so glad she's here. Um, has emerging technology changed the way to design or build a show? For example, 3D printing or 3D weaving of fabrics is common um, now in, in fashion and, and around the world. Uh, how is it different than what it was a few years ago? Oh, fantastic. Well, there's two parts to that. So there's the designing part, but then also the, the execution, the realization of the design. And the realization of the design is tremendously different uh, now because you can send off a design that you have created in a software and have it printed. So you can customize your own designs like we, we I mean, you, I remember hand painting and trying to, you know, paint pinstripes on things and make it look good. Um, and so that, that's that, that you can get more customized things that way. Um, I do think also that the, the digital patterning, my colleague Heather Milam, who heads our costume technology program, you know, and, and uh, does uh, digital patterning and so forth and 3D printing, uh, we can create mass produce things, um, prop, uh, costume pieces like your, your beautiful brooch, you know, uh, things like that. Um, and so the technology has, the one of the downsides of the execution, however, is, and, and this is where, you know, we were talking about how it's hard to be objective about your contemporary time. I get concerned about the use of shipping and the amazon.com for a contemporary work and props and things like that. Because it's not only that one, you, you're shipping, so environmentally, if that's coming around the world, time-wise, it may seem cheaper, but you know, what's the long what's the long-term damage of the, but the other is that, you know, it's harder to watch. And this is important. This is a whole nother lecture sometime or a whole nother discussion. But it is hard sometimes to monitor the <clears throat> humanity of who's the labor creating these things, <coughs> whether it's the fabric or, um, excuse me, whether it's the fabric or the merchandise. When you get something that's mass manufactured, it's hard to know you know, who was the labor and how were they treated? And then how much were they paid for this that we, we paid so little for it? So that can spiral into some pretty heavy discussions and important discussions about our work. The design side of it is interesting, especially this last year with Zoom, because we can FaceTime some fittings now. It's possible to, it, the cost effectiveness of digital designing, it, the important thing is, is not to lose the human contact with the artistic team and the actors, but there are some times when we don't have to fly as much. Um, I can, I have, um, I can digitally reproduce sketches in a higher resolution with, but I, I still can't control what, what people will see on their monitor as far as color, but we can always use swatches um, so we can use the number of the Pantone 
to to kind of give us that. Okay, that was very long. <laughs> no, not at all. Okay. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, how often do you travel to see productions for inspiration? I'm gonna um, amend this probably to before the pandemic. Okay, before the <laughs> pandemic, yeah. Uh, a lot, a lot. As a matter of fact, it's very important that wherever I travel, I teach a study abroad course in London with students as well. And, you know, you just dive in and for three weeks, you're just seeing every possible type of show, good, bad, ugly, immersive, West End, <laughs> fringe, everything that you can get in to, to feed that what you need to see. During the pandemic, I, I just watched so much digital theater. I, 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 my eyes were sore and my head hurt. But um, as a matter of fact, uh, this weekend, uh, the, the weekend after Thanksgiving, uh, I'm driving up to Chicago to Chicago Lyric Opera because there's a, a um, magic flute I've wanted to see that's German expressionism. And I've wanted to see it for years. So I'm excited that it's finally in the United States. So yes, anytime I'm shopping in New York, I'm seeing shows all the time. It's really important, but just as important are the museums and the exhibitions and just walking around the streets of other countries or cultures that are different from your own and seeing how people move and wear and, and the integrity with which they live in their clothing. I recall a time right before I, I joined IU as a visiting professor where we were both in New York fabric shopping shows <laughs> and we ended up at the same Broadway show <laughs> together. Wait a minute, was that Anastasia? That was Anastasia. <laughs> yeah, I took I took one of our grads for her for her um, graduation present. Yeah, to, to that, that's great. Yeah, I, re I remember that now. Well, yeah, nice. except I, I remember also the digital monitor went out at one point on the show. Oh, there, yes, but, there was, yes, yeah. There was a Yeah, I was projection. like, what is that? What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> they so just go good. wrong even on Broadway. Yeah, see, there you go. <laughs> well, I'll ask a question of mine too, spinning off of that. Do you have any good stories of things gone wrong on stage in terms of costume? Oh, oh so many. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell a couple of stories. Um, you know, I started to tell the story of the the uh, guy who wanted his horns, the, the director, uh, who was actually Howard Jensen, who was on faculty here a long time ago. Um, and he wanted the horns on this actor to uh, uh, start on fire and disappear on stage. Well, we happened to be at the Utah Shakespeare Festival, which is very close to Las Vegas. And so uh, working with some very a creative team, we called in magicians from Las Vegas to help us and invested in creating all of these horns from flash paper that were wired and they came down the back of the doublet and down the sleeve and he, every night he'd go poof and you know and, and they would they would go poof and and disappear but one night they did poof and one went and the other stayed <laughs> it didn't go and so every night it was like are they working you know and this is for a whole summer um i think that there's uh you know, there, there's just, um, gosh, uh, if the funny stories of things gone wrong, I, you, wouldn't, you know, I can't think of anything right at the moment. Right. Always when, when, when someone asks, cause I have oh. a million stories until someone asks. Well, right. I do remember a young guy, uh, uh, on stage, a student on stage running off um, and he's, he was kind of crawling backstage I mean, he wasn't on his knees, but he was running back and he was desperate and he's like, pants ripped, show ruined, you know, it was this kind of thing. So there, there's little things like that. It's always, always pretty fun, you know? <laughs> yes. A lot of, I, I've seen a lot of pants blow out during oh, dance yeah. numbers. Yeah. That's probably the most common. <laughs> yes. Yes. Some rather epic ones as well. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, uh, so speaking to that too, what are some accommodations that get made to uh, costumes to help do the extraordinary things that sometimes performers do, especially in musicals and ballet? Um, sure. Well, you know, what's amazing is that many things have been designed in the past in dance and so forth with, uh, to accommodate movement by putting all these gussets in. So they were rather complicated and, um, so a lot of people think a dancer needs something more loose when in fact you want it really up in under the arm and in, in the crotch, you know, when you have to 
kick and so forth. And um, so one of the things that um, I think was, uh, 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 I, I think one of the accommodations is, and this goes to the earlier question about technology, is stretch fabric. Because you can buy exquisite wools and silk with lycra in them now, spandex. Mm -hmm. And so you can't, you don't have to manipulate with gussets. You don't, you, you know, you can do something that looks a little more um, uh, fitted and, and, and without all that additional stuff. Uh, so that is something that's that's very important. Um, things are quick rigged so much. Things are faked and put together um, so much. Uh, accommodations have to be made. I had one woman years ago, and uh, a union actress, an equity actress, who was uh, in a play where she has a line, and sh she says, uh, "You know, it's a hundred degrees in the shade." And, but this actress refused, she was very insecure about her arms. So she refused to wear short sleeves or anything. So, so we accommodated her by looking at ways, just, I just worked with her and talked through, well, what would this character wear? If, you know, if, um, and, and what would that look like? So we, we figured out ways. So there's both personal accommodations and then there's accommodations for the movement and needs. Um, but finding ways to hide stuff. Everyone's always like, can you put a pocket in that? <laughs> it's a unitard. Where am I going to put a pocket? Anyway. And so. microphone packs. That's the other oh, thing. <laughs> yes. Microphone packs. You people, I, I just want to say you would not believe where we put microphone, <laughs> microphone Everywhere. Packs. Everywhere. Yeah. Inside of wigs. Inside, you know, yeah. Everywhere. places not mentioned. Not, we shouldn't mention here. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have time for one more question. And there's one in the chat here. Where do you like to shop in LA? And I'll add on, where do you like to shop in LA and New York? Oh, okay. Well, here's the thing. Ch Chinatown uh, has wonderful places and LA is not a place that I'm really familiar with. And so most of the, the shopping for me in LA is actually long distance shopping. So I want I do want to clarify that. Chicago, I, I there's uh, a few places in Chicago. New York, uh, the reason I, pref I really like New York is there's the big standard places. Now, here's the thing. I am speaking. So those of you who live in New York <laughs> are probably like, well, that's not here anymore, Linda. Uh, <laughs> I'm, little, I'm a little worried to go back to New York about some of the places to shop. But, uh, you know, there's the standard, uh, like um, um, the... Uh, Oh, I'm losing a uh, uh, mood fabric, obviously B and J fabric, but there was Rosen and Chaddock, which was the most incredible wools. And that is closed down. It also had, they also had candy bowls. Oh, they had candy. They always had Tootsie Rolls. Those are yes. great. Yeah. And then you have elegant New York, which is an uh, incredible fabric and a shout out to an alum. One of the sons of the owner of God went to Kelly school of business. So. We always like see the Indiana sweatshirt when they're there. Anyway, um, and then, but what's really great are the mom and pop stores like AK Fabric and Hamad and, and the various uh, smaller ones that we may not know the, 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 you know, the names sometimes will change out or they're uh, Vogue something else, you know, or Vogue this, Vogue that. Um, and those mom and pop stores are really the ones where you're, you know, digging and pulling things out, but they're always, they, they, it's a very similar to a market type of shopping. And so the more yardage you get, the better the price, and they're always trying to reduce it. So the more you get the, of a lot of fabrics, they're going to work it out. And then they usually throw things in. I always come home with free fabrics, but they're, they remember you too. And that kind of service is really important. But um, the reason I like places, uh, the bigger stores like Elegant and B&J and, and, and Mood and so forth is you get to work with an associate, get to know them. And so when you have to call long distance, that's good. Um, yeah, I, I hope to be shopping in LA this spring. So if, <laughs> if, if someone should contact me after that and I can tell you. We've also uh, shopped a lot in Chicago. I've yep. done some shopping in Vegas. Um, and, and there's Soho some good shopping. 
Yeah, oh, London. Yeah. There's also some good shopping in Minneapolis too. So yeah, yeah, that's oh, that's right. Minneapolis has uh, I can't remember the name of the big. Store. I know I'd have to look it yeah. up. Um, well, that's all the time we have for questions tonight. Um, thank you all for submitting your questions. And now I'm going to hand it back over to Vanessa uh, to finish out our webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you again for joining us and participating in this evening's live stream. I would like to thank Professors Pisano and Orlinko for their time and expertise. We are grateful to you all. I would also like to thank the IU Alumni Association and its members for assisting with tonight's program. Finally, I should acknowledge that events like this would not be possible without the support of donors who understand the value of a liberal arts education. If you would like to support the faculty, students, and programs of the College of Arts and Sciences, please consider making a contribution to the Arts and Sciences Priority Fund at the Indiana University Foundation. Until next time, take care and stay safe.